Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's panel event on the proposed reforms to U.S. food aid. I'm Brett Nadrich. I'm the editor-in-chief of foodpolicy.us. Foodpolicy.us is a multimedia platform designed to foster broad-based dialogue about our food system. Uh, our core mission is to cultivate dialogue and to grow a movement. Our site provides a forum for substantive discussions about the challenges uh, we face in making our food system healthier and more sustainable. Our events, panels, lectures, pop-up restaurant gatherings cover a wide range of topics, and we are headquartered here in Washington, D.C. We want to thank everyone involved in uh, making today's event possible, particularly our partners at NYU Washington, D.C., and our distinguished panelists and speakers. A round of applause for everyone involved, please. We'll be live tweeting today's event. Uh, we encourage you to in join the dialogue using the hashtag food policy events. And please, to submit a question or comment for the Q&A, you can tweet directly at food policy US. Audience members can find a social media insert inside their event programs. And for the folks watching the live feed at home, we will be periodically displaying the Twitter information throughout today's event. At this point, it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished moderator, the Honorable Dan Glickman. Thanks uh, Thank so you. much for being here. Thanks, uh, Brett and Marlon, for uh, uh, putting this on. And it's an important topic, um, and we'll talk about it in some degree of depth. But before we start, I think we have a video from Earthrin Cousin, who's the uh, head of the World Food Program in Rome, and I think Earthrin has a video for us. So let's proceed with that. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in what is both a timely and important discussion. After 50 years of serving the world's global hungry poor, WFP has, through hard work and solid performance, developed a worldwide reputation as the partner who delivers, particularly during times of emergency. We have delivered food and non-food items efficiently and effectively, sometimes in dire emergencies, working to ensure that no child, no family goes hungry. For most of the first 50 years, delivering has often meant delivering large quantities of food from one part of the world to large numbers of needy people in another part of the world. Whatever the crisis or the challenge, WFP, working with partners, delivered the food. As a result, children didn't go hungry. The problem was that even when food was available, we delivered food, often negatively impacting smallholder farmers in the communities we were working to help. I don't want to oversimplify a very complex situation, but for sake of argument and brevity, let me say that humanitarian community recognizes the value of food when food is not available. But we also recognize that we can oftentimes more efficiently and effectively meet the needs of the hungry poor while simultaneously supporting resilience building and opportunities for communities to become sustainably and durably food secure. These opportunities require different response mechanisms. There is no clear line between the work of humanitarians and the work of the development professionals. We are all dedicated to the same ultimate goal, that of lifting people and communities out of poverty and hunger and helping them live healthy, productive lives. In the past year or two, the humanitarian and the development communities have both been speaking extensively about the need to support activities that build resilience and support more comprehensive approaches for the nutritional requirements of undernourished populations. Think about sun, reach, 1,000 days, 450 days, and recent discussions about the importance of meeting the nutritional needs of adolescent girls. Woven into these discussions is also a significant dialogue on the importance of safety net programs, in particular school feeding activities, and the role that those programs play in a range of areas, helping meet nutritional needs, supporting education, and keeping girls in school. In my opinion, this discussion of the need to build resilience, support comprehensive nutritional interventions, and encourage safety net programs, particularly school feeding in the least developed countries, is exactly the right conversation for us all to be having. But beyond talking about 
how important these issues are and these programs are, we must also talk about how we all, all of us together, operational organizations like WFP, donors, both governments and institutions, as well as host governments, will actually support these new types of activities. Because you see, while the talk about resilience, nutrition, and safety nets is good, the resource streams, operational modalities, and institutional collaboration have not kept pace with our understanding of how best to help lift people out of hunger and food insecurity. There's been a fair amount of attention, in fact, and a debate around Obama, the Obama administration's proposal to reform U.S. food aid programs. And of course, WFP is often asked to take a position, either on the merits of the administration's proposal or on the merits of those who don't want to see any change. While it's important to state that WFP does not lobby governments to change the way they support WFP, and as such, I will not take a position on the specifics of the Obama administration's food aid reform plan, it is my job to talk about and advocate for the resources and support necessary to meet the changing needs of the world's vulnerable and hungry poor. Yes, we must meet the emergency food needs of the hungry poor, but we must also begin to build resilience of that same community. Speaking just for WFP, donors must also decide if they really want to support the longer term interventions that resilience, improved nutrition, and safety net activities will require. Host governments must continue to build their capacity to manage these interventions directly and to increase their financial investment toward the goal of graduating from international assistance and helping their own people. In other words, we all may know the prescription for assisting the most vulnerable, but we must also be willing to commit to the longer term investments that will be required and modify our operational approaches to ensure the maximum sustainable impact of those investments. Many of our donors now recognize that cash increases the flexibility as well as the effectiveness of WFP and our partners, ensuring that we can respond with the right food assistance interventions at the right time. Whether that tool, that intervention tool, is cash or food or other program modalities. For example, in any given year in the Sahel, WFP may need to transition from the delivery of in-kind food to cash or voucher or a combination of all of these programs. Recognizing this need for enhanced flexibility is a key component of the Obama administration's food aid reform effort. Since I began my tenure with WFP over a year ago, I made addressing the need to transform the way WFP approaches its work a priority through my Fit for Purpose agenda. This includes working with partners to think differently about how we solve hunger problems, to see beyond the crisis, to a future where the hungry meet their own food security and nutrition needs. We know the prescription. We have the prescription for assisting the most vulnerable. We know we must now all commit together to the longer term investments, including flexible resourcing, as well as integrated planning and implementation, that those things that are required to ensure the maximum sustainable impact in the most efficient manner possible. We must all work together, but we must all work differently. And I look forward to working with all of you to ensure that we achieve our shared goal of eliminating global hunger and food insecurity. So, uh, sorry that she's not here, but I think we can probably uh, know the work of the World Food Program, which is the largest supplier of food to the hungry in the world, and the work the United Nations does all over the world at, at great risk to themselves, um, and the importance and the uh, innovations that they're taking place to do a lot of good stuff. So saying that, we have uh, three experts here in various uh, backgrounds from uh, from Dr. Finn, who's a world expert on in 
food aid, hunger, development issues. Uh, Ellen Levinson, who I've worked with for many, many years in the, in the food aid, food security, and congressional side of the picture, and my friend Roger Johnson, who's heads the National Farmers Union and used to give me a lot of grief as the uh, agriculture commissioner in North Dakota and other places as well, but he's a hell of a guy. I want you to know that, notwithstanding that. Anyway, I think the subject is really important, and, and this is intended to be a good discussion about the role of food aid and food policy, and I, I think it's in, also in, in confluence with what's happening to farm legislation as well, because the food aid reforms that have been talked about have been in both appropriations bills and in authorizing legislation, but to the extent that we get a farm bill or not get a farm bill will have a, an impact, I think, on these issues in the years to come. Uh, but, but talking about food aid issues, I would ask each of you in your own backgrounds to talk about what do you think is best about what America does in food aid and food assistance? I mean, if you had to analyze and give a short water cooler speech about what it is that this means to the world and how important it is. So I'm going to start with you, Ellen, because you've been on the ground at these things. Um, yeah. Okay, that's on. Hi, Ellen Levinson. Thank you very much for sponsoring this event, Food, Aid, Food Policy US. Uh, it's a new venue for me, so I was glad to be introduced to it. And thanks, Dan, for the introduction. First of all, I think what when I think of food aid, I think of the Food for Peace Act. I, it's a long-standing act uh, established in 1954. Before that, we had given food aid to other countries, but this created a, a law that provided long-standing support for food assistance worldwide. And to me, what the United States brings to the table is number one, leadership. It brings together expertise. It looks at not just immediate needs, but what we need to do for the longer term. Our food aid programs have broken ground in nutrition and in agriculture and what we call resilience or capacity building in very poor areas. So I think we have done a lot in order to bring forward the dialogue on food aid into how it affects food security, agriculture development, and nutrition, how it can help communities build their resilience. So we're a reliable supplier. We're number one when it comes to being there. And we also are contributing to a great degree, both to early warning as well as interventions. So that, that's what I see us as. I see us as a world leader because of this. Roger? Well, and especially as someone who's represented agriculture and yeah. food producers, uh, yeah. you offered a somewhat different context to this. Yeah, most of my life I spent as a farmer in North Dakota. And every farmer I know, is proud of what they do because they produce food and they don't want to see people go hungry. And it's pretty elementary, it's pretty basic, it's ethical, it's moral, it's got all those dimensions. And I think, uh, you know, what we do as a country to provide food for folks who are hungry, who are starving, who are malnourished, in this country and around the world is something that all of us as farmers, I think, are immensely proud of. And we're gratified with the idea that we are doing well compared to the rest of the world, certainly very well in many respects. And uh, we want to do our part to make sure that folks don't go to bed hungry. And if I want to follow up, in, in the past, you know, the U.S. has been able to provide a very significant amount of food assistance in large part because we've produced a yeah. lot more than we've consumed. So we've either sold it or provided it in humanitarian efforts. If you're looking down the road five or ten years, you think we're still going to have an abundance of food to give away? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, in my lifetime farming, there are at least three major periods. Uh, when I started in the 70s and up through the current time when we've had this big discussion because prices have gone up for egg commodities uh, and food costs have gone up much more dramatically in countries where they spend a much larger portion of their income on food than here. Uh, and the concern is that we're not producing enough food uh, to feed the hungry 
uh, in the world, and in every circumstance, the market has subsequently collapsed. We've had a long period of low prices, and we still have hungry people. Uh, and so, it, in my judgment, this is as much about income and economic opportunity for people anywhere as it is about whether we have enough food. I think, you know, my training is in economics. I'm a believer that uh, if the signals are there, we're going to produce, and we're going to produce a lot. Um, and, uh, and I think we will, the, the real question is, is there an effective market that is created by those folks who don't have money so that they can get food? So I look at it as much so you see from an economic more, perspective. And so you don't see any massive gloom and doom about the inability to produce enough food for a changing world. I'm reminded of any number of studies that talk about anywhere between a third and some say as much as half of all the food that's produced in the world is wasted. Uh, in third world countries, it tends to be wasted before it ever gets to the, to the, to the consumer because you have uh, infrastructure issues and poor production practices and, and not good storage practices and those sorts of things. In countries like ours, we waste it because we put too much on our plate and we throw it away. Uh, and so there are lots of things that we can do to reduce waste and that therefore increase supply. Uh, do I think the earth is gonna be continually constrained? Yeah, I, I do. But I also believe that if we have the right policies in place, we'll allocate those resources and we'll figure out a way to get these to get the production that we need in order to feed folks who are hungry. Dr. Fan, you are a, you had IFPRI. You're a world expert on food production. I mean, in not only this country but but all over the world. I wonder if you might comment on both questions. Number one is how do you view U.S food assistance programs, and two, do we have enough food to feed the world of the next 20 or 30 or 40 years? Sure. Well, let me first thank the uh, Food Policy U.S. in organizing this uh, timely debate. So you have two words that are similar well, to my institute's, uh, institute's name, International Food Policy Research Institute, Food Policy, <laughs> we're international here in USA. It's great that you're organizing this debate. I think U.S. right now is debating about a new way of doing business in terms of its international food aid. I think this is great. The U.S. food aid has contributed to poverty reduction, hunger reduction in many parts of the world, starting from PPL 480, Pakistan, India, and so on. So many people have been saved. So without this program, many people may have died. So I should say that the, the uh, food aid program played a huge role in saving millions of lives. But today the world has changed, particularly global market has changed. So the new way of doing business is so critical. So moving away from continued domestic purchase, the sh the ship the grains to other countries and monetize the food aid is not a way to do it anymore. So we have a much better, efficient way to spend that resources, that money, to help more people and more hungry people out of poverty, out of hunger. So local purchase, EPRI study shows that local purchase, you know, if the food aid purchases food from local markets, then the smallholder farmers, you know, I was a farmer, smallholder farmer back in China, so if I say something against a farmer, I don't feel much guilty about it. <laughs> um, so the local smallholders will benefit from that you know, because you provide a market for them. And the smallholders, smallholder farmers, account for 70-80% of hungry and malnourished people in the world. You know, if you let them to have a chance to produce more food, then they will be out of hunger and poverty. So that's one. A second, Sometimes it's not just food transfer, it's not just food. Cash or vouchers could be even more effective. You know, there are lots of um, not just problems, even governance challenges, corruptions in handling food. 
India tax it have shown that it's not just the U.S. food aid, even their own domestic food aid program involves lots of transactions costs. Sometimes to give away one dollar on food aid, you need to to spend three dollars, four dollars in handling that. So if you just give the poor people the cash, that transaction cost is so easy. Deposit the money to their bank bank account, and it's a good governance, easy to track, e- easy to monitor. So the two points I wanted to make here is one is domestic purchase, sorry, the uh, local purchase. Second, move away from just the food aid to cash to vouchers could be even more effective. In and just quickly, people. and I'm going to turn to Ellen because I know that she may want to talk about some of these issues. The issue of do we have enough yeah. uh, food cap- production capability to feed a growing population and, and, and one that income levels are increasing in the next 20, 30, 40 years? Yeah. Well, I think there are two issues here. One is the total availability, <laughs> total amount of food. Second is distribution. Today, yes, probably we have total amount of food in the world. But it, the problem is some people who need food do not have food. You said economic means in purchasing food. And, some, and the people who have food do not have way to, to give the food to other people who are in need. So in terms of total availability, by 2050, we needed to produce 60% more food. For poor country, for developing country, we need to double the food production. I agree, 30% of the food is wasted. We can reduce the waste by another 20%. That, that's about it. To further reduce that is very difficult. So we've got to produce more. So total availability needs to be resolved, no doubt about it. But more importantly is distribution issue. So it's not just a food aid to give poor people food, rather to give them means, economic, economic means to purchase food from the market, or economic means to produce their own food. So this is critical. The second one is more critical probably than the first one. Thank you. Ellen, I'm going to turn to you now because you've been in the midst of this food aid, food aid reform debate and we sometimes have been on opposite sides of this issue, but you, you do know and been immersed in the issue for many years. As you know, the administration has proposed uh, fairly significant changes in food aid, uh, uh, going from a uh, commodities to a cash-based system in some form, whether it's 100% or 55% or whatever else it is, ending cargo preference or limiting it, ending the monetization of food aid overseas so the proceeds are sold and they're provided to others on the ground who will be delivering food aid programs and doing humanitarian things. And, you know, this has created quite a stir in those who follow this issue. Um, and there are people on different sides of the position. And, I, and you've heard what Dr. Fenn has said about this subject. I wonder if you might talk about it and respond and how you feel about it. So um, what I'm noticing is that food assistance for many years was our main form as the United States to promote food security. In fact, the purpose of the law is to use, the Food for Peace Act is to use U.S. commodities to promote food security in developing countries, and it gives you a range of options. It's for chronic hunger, it's for urgent needs, and it's also for shortfalls in the market. Predominantly, we were using it for shortfalls in the market for many years, government to government agreements. And that was what you're calling monetization, what we called sales. They were very concessional loans, so they were often forgiven. So it was just really almost a giveaway, uh, but sold in the market and not much focus on how the proceeds were used. Then over time, the reduction in food aid, because honestly, in a good sense, I, we have all seen since the 80s, I mean, there's a downside to structural reform in some of the economies of the world, but in some economies, it really has created better marketing systems and a better and more open agricultural economy. So we are seeing positive developments, and indeed, that's a good news, and we should be helping them more in improving their productivity, their, their rural and agricultural and food systems, their research and development capabilities. That is where a lot of that emphasis, you know, that's true. But there are still a lot of countries that need food assistance. I mean, I, I like to look at the good news myself because, you know, I, I like to be an optimist. But the truth is we have a lot of shortfalls, not only 800 and whatever number it was. People have, a, you know, somewhere between 850, 870 million people who are 
not being enough, and I mean day to day, not emergencies, but day to day, every day, or seasonally, they just don't get enough to eat, their children therefore are stunted, they don't get the, the developmental boost that we all hope a child will get from adequate nutrition young in life. Okay, what happens in those cases? And what happens not just for those emergencies we're running to deal with on a constant basis and try to keep up with? So I think we need to think along two tracks, and, and this is where it's hard to do that, and you will understand this. I mean, Dan Glickman probably knows this much better than I. It's much easier to take a position on one side or another. If you do that, then you have something to push against. But the truth of the matter is we need a solution that includes food aid, including in-kind food aid from countries that produce a lot of food, as well as not just local purchase and not just cash transfers, but a, a commitment to food security and agriculture policy and, and supporting the development of the smallholder and the economies of these poor countries and boosting nutrition. We know this. I think it's a moment in time when it's actually happening. So we should all applaud that, but we shouldn't throw out the fact that we still need the in-kind food aid. I, I mean, we, we witness that. I work with a lot of organizations that are nonprofits. They conduct food for peace programs. Uh, they are seeing in the areas where they're located that the food makes a difference. If you have a food for work program, people will do the work on that project because honestly, they want that commodity. It's not that give me cash and I'll go to my little market there. That's not gonna be enough and also you don't have enough. So you still need it and that's for chronic needs. And for mother child health and nutrition programs, uh, there's been a boost in the, looking at more nutritious foods. And here in the United States, we are developing some of those. And I think that's a good thing. And I think it's good for us to keep in that and keep pushing that piece. So there is a need for in-kind food aid. Whether, so we can't just say throw that out. And it has diminished how much we're giving in in-kind food aid. And we have increased what's available for local purchase. There's $300 million is available for local purchase right now. And it's not just local from the small farmer. Most of that is being bought from brokers, um, large brokers overseas like Africa on the African continent. It's really not from small farmers. So it would be ideal if, you know, yes, indeed, that we're going to help all these small farmers by buying locally. But we can't get there from where we are today. We first have to build the capacity so you have the food quality, the safety. I mean, this whole thing on you know, aflatox. And we have issues that come up. We've had to destroy food aid that's bought locally, and I know you're familiar with that because of the aflatoxin issue, and IFPRI is very active in that of trying to ameliorate that problem. So we have issues. So yes, we want to be able to buy locally, but it's a push-pull, you know what I mean? Yes, indeed, by saying we'll buy from you, that's a good news, right? We'll be a market, another market for you, food aid. That's a pull, but you still have to have the push. You have to have the capacity building activities, and that's not going to happen just by giving money for local purchase. Okay, but I'm going to ask you all this question, but the administration has, uh, perhaps their proposal wasn't as clear or well thought out at the beginning as it should have been. But as it's developed, it's basically they say the following. We just need more flexibility. The law prohibits us from going beyond whatever is limited under the cash uh, transfer side of the legislative picture. And that, yeah, we, we do need uh, commodities in some cases to deal with international crises. But we ought to be encouraging much more self-sufficiency, food productive capability. So I, we'd like the flexibility. They've used a 55% number saying that at least 55% would be in commodities and, and whatever it is for one year. And they've, of course, talked about the end of monetization and reforms on cargo preference to try to get more bang from our buck. So, What's wrong with their proposal? I'd ask you first, then I'd go down okay. the list. Yeah. Well, I think their proposal has the weak, the, the, let me tell you the positive side of their yeah. proposal. Because good. I actually think there are a couple of very good things in there. Number one is what you said, uh, the first thing, the flexibility. Um, definitely everybody, I mean, anybody who works from the, in the field agrees that you need to have a variety of tools to meet food. And we're just talking food aid. We're not talking now about you know, the bigger agriculture development picture because remember, this is just contained and using the money from Food for Peace only, and that's food aid. So looking at that, yes, it's good. I mean, that's a positive. They want more flexibility to use other tools, cash to support development food aid programs, more, you know, we have food aid programs that are more developmental, like mother child health and food for work and that help build local capacity so people who are chronically hungry can care for themselves. So more cash to go with that. So number one, that's a plus. Number two, they're looking for more funding cash 
for local procurement of commodities, and we're in an emergency context, okay? So, in cash transfers. So those are good things. The downside is how they went about it. To say that we should just shift money from the Food for Peace Act, um, which has a budget, it has its own line item, and it's in the Agriculture Appropriations Bill, it comes under a bill every year, and say, let's just dissolve that account and shift that money into two general accounts, which already have money in there for a lot of other purposes. One's called development assistance, and the other one is called international disaster assistance. That is not good, because it's commingled with those other funds, and we, no matter what they say, about 55% will go here or there. It's, it's not going to. So let yeah. me, just hypothetically, if they had blocked off that money and not transferred it into the other appropriations account, but basically have limited how it would be spent according to the ways they had in mind, would that have made it better for you? Well, actually, there is another way to do it, and this is, the, to us, the best way. You keep the Food for Peace Act intact, its purpose with the U.S. commodity side, its programmatic orientation, because there's a lot of research behind some of those programs on the development side, and also the emergency side. So you have emergency and you have development programs under there right now. But what you do is, as the administration is finding, if you really look at the numbers, they needed about $250 million more in cash than they got, than they have right now under international disaster assistance. They have $300 million for local purchase and cash transfers. What they needed was about $250 million more. What we thought they would have done, and we're surprised they didn't do because they were leaning in that direction before this new proposal, is to request that additional funding. The reason is, you can go into Congress and say, here, we're doing this, it's working, it's under international disaster assistance, please plus up that account. I'm talking practically now. This is how you get there. And then under the Food for Peace program, okay, we need more cash because we don't think monetization works in these different countries. Let's work out a way to get that cash within Title II, the Food for Peace Act, to support those programs. And you think they could have gotten an extra $250 million in this current budget environment? No. Well, actually, last year, you know, fiscal 13, fiscal 13. I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, 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 I'll no. go to the other part. Uh, listen, no, I think they would have had a problem. I uh, No, no, I'm not saying that. But the way they presented it, they have a bigger problem. Because it says, the Food for Peace Act, oh good, that's something we can zero out. We can look at it as something to cut. You know, and they're running in saying it's inefficient, it's this and that, and they're saying, great, it's a great thing to cut. So I actually think they've done a terrible disservice because it is an important program, it is serving many needs, and, and their calculations of how much they're gonna save, I think, are a little bit over-exaggerated, particularly on the cargo preference side, since that money, that 50 million they're saving, that money went back into the program plus more, 100 million a year. So they're actually losing money from food aid by getting rid of the cargo preference piece because we actually got money back into the program. So if you know the numbers, I'm saying they went about it, I think, in a way that hurts the program and makes it harder to get sustained funding going forward. But I think we can work it out going forward. I think there is a way. Um, and you know, I think in the end of the day, the Food for Peace Act is going to suffer in its total funding. Okay, I would go Dr. Fan, okay. and then I'm going to go to Roger. Cause... Let me speak uh, from the perspective of a recipient countries, whether in-kind cash or vouchers would work better for them. In a country or in a region where the local markets do not work, where the women and children are discriminated, then the in-kind direct food aid would help tremendously, because you give the food to the mouth of children and women who are in need, where the local markets do not work. In what kind of situation the voucher would work? That where there is a very well-functioning local markets, so the people can buy the bundle of the food they need. And our evidence shows that vouchers actually help to improve the dietary quality. It's not just the total calorie, right? If you just give people maize or corn or rice or wheat, that you will encourage them to consume this sort of lower quality type of food. So vouchers will help to avoid that, actually improve the quality of their diet. That means improve their nutrition status. Vouchers. Cash. Cash works when you, your target is, is to improve the overall welfare of the households. So these three different kinds of transfers have different purposes. So that it have to be context specific. Now how can we really move towards a long-term development objective where the smallholders can produce more? 
like what uh, Roger said, where they can produce their, more, uh, produce their food, they can have their own economic means. And the food assistance program, or food aid program, should really try to improve the local markets. You know, use some of the food, it proceeds to improve the local markets. And even to work on building some of the reserves. You, know, you talk about emergency purpose. Where do you get your food? To ship the food from US to, let's say, to Horn of Africa, it takes six months. When the food is there, it's too late. So how can we work with WFP? Well, Ethel is not here. She would support my point to set up some of the regional reserve, even national reserve, for emergency purpose. When there is a drought, when there is a flood, when there is a market shocks, the poor people will be able to access to that reserve in a very short period of time, two weeks, three weeks, not three months, six months. So the pre-positioning yeah. of food is one of the solutions that we need to do a better job. Yeah. So I think how and, can and we... local yeah. reserves, yeah. Yeah. Indigenous the reserves, reserves, how can we work together? Yeah. So Roger, okay, so uh, you lead one of the big farm organizations in the country. You've been a farmer yourself. I testified uh, before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and one of the members of Congress pulled out a bag that said USAID or USDA, and they said, you know, we don't want to give this up for cash. We want to have it so people will know it comes from the American yeah. farmers. And somebody else said, you know, if you're hungry and poor, that's probably secondary to yeah. getting the quantities of food themselves. And it sounded like more of a, you know, more of an obviously a political reason to support that. Yeah. But how do you feel about all this stuff as representing a major farm organization? Well, change is difficult. Okay, let's just recognize that. Let's also recognize that government sometimes is not the model of efficiency. <laughs> Let me underscore this point. When these programs were first developed, we were in a period of time when there was significant overproduction in this country. And the government had policies to pull commodities off the market and in fact owned storage facilities all over the country. There was one four miles down the road from my farm. And it was all government-owned grain in those grain mills. And so there was a dual purpose back then. We need to get rid of that stuff so that we can have higher prices and farmers can survive in this country. But at the same time, let's be benevolent and make sure we feed poor, hungry people in other parts of the world, right? Well, it made a lot of sense then to sort of take these stocks and move them into those kinds of places of need. Today, here's what we're doing. We're actually, because the government doesn't own these stocks anymore. Those grain bins have long since been sold. Government stocks are gone. I actually think we ought to have some reserve stocks. As, as but that's controversial even in this country. That's controversial yeah. in this country. But, and that's a whole different question. But the point is this, government does not own these grain stocks. So what they do in order to provide this aid through these stocks is they go into the market and buy the commodities in the US off of the, you know, from our existing stocks. And then they turn around and ship that stuff halfway around the world, give it to somebody who then sells it, turns it into money, and then they use that money for what they want to do. Now, I'm somewhat oversimplifying it, but not a whole lot. And what happens in that process is you lose a whole bunch of money. I mean, if the money that was used to buy that bushel of wheat to begin with here was simply used to provide food for hungry people or development or, or whatever, it, it would be a more efficient system. So the, I think the point is the world has changed. Uh, as Sven said earlier, this is... The world is much different than it was when these programs were established, and we ought to recognize that. We ought to try and figure out a way to be more efficient. This is not a simple thing, and the same answer doesn't work in every place. I think that's a point that all of, everyone up here has made, and I, I think it's worth underscoring. There are circumstances where giving food makes more sense, and others where maybe giving money. And try. But when I opened, I, I made the point about if farmers are given the incentives and you, you try to create circumstances so markets will work, you will get a much better result in the end. And so 
to Dr. Finn's point about we need to uh, we need to create where there are markets that are struggling to exist. We got to have policies that try and hold those market prices relatively stable and provide incentives for those farmers, many of whom are the hungry ones that we're trying to feed, okay, to produce more of their food. And, and we can, I think we can do things more efficiently. Okay. If I were going to fault the yes. administration for their, the proposal, I would say it was a strategic problem more than it was a policy problem. I mean, I think their argument basically is pretty sound. We want to be more efficient. We want to be less hidebound to all these old rules. And we want flexibility to do to employ the right tool in the right place. Right. But change is difficult in this city. And I think that's one of the So, so let me ask you, from, so you get done a good job of describing the history of surpluses, which dominated US domestic farm policy and dominated this issue to some degree. Mm -hmm. So the argument that would farmers support and would the American taxpayers support uh, cash or vouchers as opposed to non, uh, as opposed yeah. to demands on commodities, how do you feel about that? They'll, because they'll you, you hear that in Congress a lot. So yeah. they'll, they'll support them both. I think there is a very potent political argument that exists in this town and around the world. People are really proud to have that American flag on the commodity that's presented in those circumstances where that makes sense. I, and, and as I understand how USAID operates, is in many cases, even where it isn't our actual commodity, they still have that sort of signature label. So folks know where the aid is coming from, but under, what's the most important goal here? Is it to get credit for the U.S. and for our farmers to stop some hungry person from dying? Or is the most important thing to try and prevent that hungry person from dying? 